I'd like to welcome you all to the Midwifery Advisory Council meeting. I'm Diane Holzer, the chair of this committee. I'd like to remind everybody in the room, please, to turn off your cell phones or to put them on vibrate. This meeting is being webcast. If anyone would like to provide public comment, there are forms in the back of the room to fill out um, a speaker slip and give back to Mrs. Moriarty. Mrs. Moriarty, there she is. <laughs> Um, MAC members, as a reminder, um, during today's meeting, well, if it doesn't look like we have a quorum, so we're not going to actually be able to vote on items, so we're going to have to go through the agenda and just go over the agenda items that are presentations only. If Dr. Adams does um, get here, then we can go back and go to the items that do need to have a vote on them, but for at this point, we don't have a quorum, so we won't be able to vote, so we're just going to be going through the agenda items that are presentation only. I would like to now call the meeting to order and ask that Mrs. Moriarty please call the roll. Dr. Adams. Ms. Brezia. Present. Ms. Dugan. Present. Ms. Perez. Ms. Yaroslavsky. Ms. Holzer. Present. We do not have a quorum. So then we can move to agenda item two, public comments that are not on the agenda. Are there any public comments from the audience? Karen Ehrlich, licensed midwife. Um, I'm just noticing um, as I read the minutes in this packet um, about the deadline of March 30th for submission of the uh, licensed midwife annual report data. When we first implemented the, this report, we made it March 30th because of a holiday in the state on March 31st. And I think it's led to a lot of confusion because a lot of people think that it should be March 31st. Isn't that the end of the month? Why is it March 30th? I also read here that OSHPED is saying that if the data has been received before the report is generated, that it will be included in the final report. But I think that it might be worth considering whether to just make that silly little change to March 31st and just allay some of the confusion around the submission date. Thank you, Karen. I can take that under advisement. Any other comments? Seeing none, we could move on to agenda item number four, report from the chair. Um, since our last meeting, I attended the medical board meeting. Um, down south, I hadn't been to a medical board meeting in a long time, so it was um, good to see it in action again. A few things I learned about the medical board was very interesting. It's, it's one of the largest medical boards in the United States. They have 40,000 doctors. And, there's, and one in six physicians in the United States holds a California license. So it's an amazing body, and they have a lot to do. One of the other new things that I had never seen before was there were some co consumer groups there. There were consumer groups. There was, in particular, a group um, dealing with maternal mortality. Uh, a young man came in with a big blow up of his wife, his pregnant wife who had died um, in the hospital and putting pressure on the medical board to do investigations for the things that have been happening. And so I saw a lot of pressures that the medical board is now under as well that it seems to be <coughs> a different thing than in the past as well. So it was very, very good for me to go back and see what the medical board is um, dealing with these days. That was eye-opening. Lots of things, many, many agenda items, much more than our agenda items. It was good to be there. The letter that um, we talked about before, the reporting form for, from licensed midwives from home deliveries to hospital reporting form, um, that was out. It is now posted on the medical board website, and it's been um, delivered to, to people, who, to parties who have expressed interest in helping to distribute it. So if anybody has any contacts there, 
other places to send this notice from the medical board <coughs> about the reporting form and the, and the law with it and the requirements for it to be sent, please let us know and we can forward it to people who can distribute it more. Um, lastly, I just kind of would like to, and I, maybe we can put this on the agenda for next time. I don't know if you can actually put brainstorming sessions on your agenda for meetings or not, but I'm interested in, in figuring out the best way, what is the most effective use of our time here on the MAC um, for, the for the year that comes the next year. Um, we've been dealing with the LMAR, and that's kind of coming to a close, and a lot of the work that we have been working on over the years is, is coming to a natural um, closure as well, and with the fact that CALM <coughs> will also be seeking legislation to create a midwifery board, what what do we want to do? What is the most effective use of our time in the in the time that we have left? If we if we do continue or don't continue, depending on what happens with the legislation, um, what are the most important things that we see as a community? to address on this board. And I would be happy to collect if people have ideas from the public, from the MAC members. Obviously, the MAC members can't have discussions about it out of the meeting, but um, I'd be willing to, if people could just forward them to me to collect them and maybe we can put it on the agenda for next time as some, some kind of cohesive discussion as to where we'd like to see the MAC and what we'd like to focus on within at our next meeting in the new year. So I don't, can we put brainstorming on agenda items? I I think that you you can ask people what they'd like to see the Mac do and have that as an agenda item. People can come up and Perfect. talk. Okay. Oh, great. So that's it for my report for today. Any questions or comments from members or from the public? Seeing none, we can move to agenda item number five, the update on the licensed midwife annual report. Ms. Alameda. Good afternoon. Um, April Alameda, Chief of Licensing. Like Ms. Holzer had stated, we are wrapping it up for the ELMAR. Uh, the new data system has been revised. Uh, Sean, who is the manager of our ISB shop, who did a wonderful job on this, is going to be giving a presentation on what it looks like. Um, within the next uh, few weeks, we are going to be sending out letters to all of the licensed midwives, letting them know that they, about the new reporting system and that it's going to be looking a little bit different and letting them know that it's time to report for 2018. So I will go ahead and turn this over, Sean. Thank you for having me today. Um, again, we've been working on uh, a new updated look and feel for the Elmar application, trying to make it a little more modern, a little more user friendly. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through every single screen, just try to point out some of the features and things that we've added to uh, make it easier for everybody. So uh, again, just a little background on Elmar. The original one was launched in 2010 and uh, Oshpet has been helping us to maintain it ever since then. Medical Board developed the code at the time, but once we turned it over to them to be the keeper of the data, um, we've been basically hands off letting them kind of modernize it at the time. If you look at it nowadays, it, it does look a little dated compared to your you know, modern websites out there and things like that. So uh, with the new forms, it, it felt like a good time to do a, a full refresh to get the whole thing updated. But we're sticking with the same kind of process where uh, Oshpet hosts the data, there, once we launch the application, they're the only ones with access to the data, and they aggregate it all and send it out to us to produce the summary report at the end of the year. So that's definitely dark there. I hope I can read my notes now. <laughs> um, so some of the new features that we've added, we'll find a happy medium here. Uh, some of the new features that we've added, again, we've, we've totally updated to match the new forms. Um, I think one of the daunting things about the old Elmar application too was that there was a laundry list on every screen that you had to fill out and it, and it made it really 
daunting when you looked at it, even though it was, you know, the same questions that you'd see on the paper form. So we stuck with the paper form questions, but we tried to make it more of, and this doesn't necessarily make it sound easier, but we went for a TurboTax look and feel, where you basically get one question at a time, and it, it walks you through it slowly, um, so you don't have that big mountain of data before you can get to the next screen. What, one of the things we heard was it timed out every 20 minutes, and so you would basically not get all the data input on the screen, and you hit next, and it, it'd say you're basically logged out, and you'd have to start over again. So we went for one question at a time. That keeps your session active and moving. Um, that, that wizard feel of if I said a certain response on this question, then the next question knows that that number should be higher or lower or, or things like that that I'll get into in, in a few minutes here. Um, another thing we heard was that more than half of the, the midwife community was inputting their data through iPads. And so having a big, long, running form made it kind of hard to do that on an iPad with all the scrolling around and everything like that. So we tried to gear it where it's, if you're on an iPad or a smaller tablet device, you see the whole thing. There's not going to be a lot of scrolling around on most of the screens. Um, in today's day and age, we have to worry about security more than we did in 2010. So um, there's some additional security features, some behind the scenes that, that you won't see, but probably the most notable one is a what's called a two-factor authentication. So basically, uh, you might have this on your banking or in your personal email or anything like that as well, but you go to connect and you provide your username and password as you would on any normal site, and the site tells you, I've sent a six-digit ID or six-digit code to your email address. Go to your email address, prove you have access to your email address to get that six-digit code, type it in here, and then we know who you are because we verified you know your password and you have access to your email. It's it's just very common in today's kinds of systems. And then uh, along with a forgot my password, we also found or we heard got feedback from Oshped that users, since they're you know, only using this usually about one time a year, they might have forgot their username since the last year. We get that a lot with Breeze too, where they only have to renew their license every two years. So. Um, we also implemented a, a forgot your username. So as long as your email address hasn't changed, we'll go ahead and tell you what your user ID was through your email, knowing that way it's still secure. Um, so the registration process is, is kind of much the same. Um, you'll provide a username of your own selection, an uh, email address that we can contact you at, your license number, the last four digits of your social security number, and your date of birth, which is what we use to match up your record to make sure your license is in good standing and you, you should be submitting an LMAR form. That way we can actually uh, know how many people have submitted their reports. And then, of course, a, a strong password and you confirm that password. Uh, once you've put in that password, basically you hit the register button there and an email gets sent out from the system. Uh, this is part of offering those things like my forgot my password and forgot my username where we got to make sure your email address is correct. Uh, some people put in bogus email addresses when they're registering for stuff, knowing that they don't want to get spam or any kind of email like that. Obviously, we're not going to be sending any junk mail to anybody off of this, so we want to make sure that that email address is true and correct before we let them continue on, or else they're just going to have more difficulty down the road. Uh, so by clicking the link in the, in the email that they received to confirm that email address, it'll take them back to the actual LMR system where it tells them their, app, their uh, registration is complete, uh, from that point on, they're, they're allowed to go ahead and log into the system. So they click here. It'll take them to the login screen. Uh, again, they can enter in their username and password there. As you see at the bottom, there's the forgot my username, forgot my password options. Um, I'll get into the support options that we have later on, too, with this redesign. But the goal is, is that if we can let the licensees help themselves, they don't have to call and, and spend the time dealing with somebody here as long as we can successfully validate who they are. So they enter in the username and password that they created during the registration and the system sends out another email. Um, it's, uh, and I, I forgot to mention the last email too, but there is a, some wording in there that tells them that if you didn't initiate this, please contact us because it might be the sign that someone's trying to, you know, access your account. Um, but it sends that six digit passcode and then they take that back and plug it into the uh, login screen. As long as they do it within five minutes and those passcodes match up, then they're granted access to the system. Uh, once they're in the system, the 
obviously for this go around, we won't have any historical data. Um, but the idea is, is that after they submit reports, they'll be there in a um, static form, uh, in a, like a PDF that they can view to see what they reported in the prior years, but obviously they won't be able to change prior year's data. Um, they will select, if they haven't started their report, they'll say, okay, I want to select my 2018 report. And, and the first question comes up, um, I'm going to show a, a sample of the report questions here because honestly there's a lot of them and I don't want to take up too much of your guys' time. Um, but just to kind of demonstrate some of the features that we've built in here. Um, so the first question is basically yes or no, did you, you know, offer services? And if they say no, then they're pretty much done. Um, but if they say yes, it enters into the main loop of uh, asking the questions that go further on through the report. Um, we've added a feature where if there's phrases, but there's phrases on the paper forms too that have definitions out there. So we've taken those same phrases and made it so you don't have to go to a separate page like you do in the current LMAR to see those definitions. You just click on it, a little box pops up, tells you what the definition of that is. Um, we have validation on all the screens, so if, if you uh, don't provide an answer, that it basically won't let you continue basic uh, you know, data validation. Once the validation is satisfied, the, the next button will be active, and then you can go ahead and proceed by just clicking next. Again, you see this. The, these examples are exactly what you see on, like, an iPad screen. So it's very simple each step of the way to keep you, keep you moving and uh, make it feel like you're getting to the end there. Um, so then we get into the idea of the wizard question. So on the forms, there are actual equations built in that say that, you know, you, if you answer this question, this question, this question, it'll total up a number for you, but you have to do it by hand like you would have to do during your taxes. So, again, we took that TurboTax idea and built it into do the math for you, and then we'll use that input to validate your future input as you're going through the application. So um, the first question is, uh, you know, how many clients did you provide services for in the year? And so if, if you say eight, like we're going to do in this example, then the next one is uh, how many were lost to care. Now on the paper form, it shows that these are being deducted from that eight. So we're inputting two here. Uh, the next question is how many uh, the pregnancies ended prior to it. In this example, we're doing zero. Uh, how many of the were still pen How many of the pregnancies were still pending delivery at the time of, of the rep year reporting year switching over? Uh, so we said one there, and then basically we get to a screen where it will show us the input that we've put in all those questions. It corresponds to a part on one of the Elmar application forms, and it does the math for you, and it tells you down at the bottom there's five clients that you're interested for in this reporting year, or that you're going to be providing data for in this reporting year. So knowing that five now, we can go ahead in subsequent questions in the report, and we can say, okay, of the five clients that you served and um, for birthing needs, now how many of them um, were the singleton births? And so that's the next question on the form. So we know the value can't be greater than five. You already told us that you're only going to be reporting five people for the year. So if you try to put seven in, just for data integrity's sake, we're not going to let you do that because you told us it should be five. If you then say, okay, I only did three on this year, then we know, okay, that your, your number, of, number of singletons then for three is, is acceptable. We'll let you proceed to the next question. But now we know you should only have two left in your reporting bucket that, that you're report, reporting on. So uh, the next question there is the uh, transfers, how many transfers that you had. So if you say now I had one transfer, then when you proceed to the next question, it's going to say, okay, of, of the one remaining then, um, how many delivered multiples. So if you say one there, you'll get to the actual uh, maternal, fetal, or infant uh, death question. And it will say, okay, you only have zero clients remaining to report on. If you try to put in a number that's going to take you past the number that you originally said you were going to report on at any step of the way through these questions, it's going to give you an error saying, you told us you're only going to do five, and now you're trying to tell us about a sixth. And so... You can use the back buttons to go back and, and change responses if necessary. Um, but hopefully everyone's got you know, kind of their documentation in order, and, and this is all very simple for them. The, um, 
So, um, and so that was an example of if you do put in the acceptable zero amount, it'll let you proceed there. Um, then it, it goes into a next section um, where it says, okay, now, you, now you've said that there was three bursts that were the singletons, so it asks you the follow-up question. These are just more examples of how we can use your past data to validate the following questions uh, to make sure your, your data is all consistent. Sometimes people accidentally, you know, phrase fat finger uh, the wrong button, and then all of a sudden you have a, a number you weren't expecting to have in there. Um, okay, so, and again, just using the same, same validation principles. Uh, at the uh, end of the first form, there is a section where, actually I skipped over that, of it, it asks you how many of, how many of the deliveries were uh, VBAC, and so it then asks you for all the client information for all the VBACs that were delivered, and so on the form, there's, I believe, three or four spaces that you can put clients in there, and they have to attach additional pages if, if they had more than that. In the application, since you told us how many you're going to submit, so we know that there's one, and you come to the screen that is kind of the summary page for the VBACs, when you first go through there, it'll say, you know, you have no VBAC clients, you need to add one. And the next button at the bottom, it's kind of hard to tell in the projection, but it's, it's um, dim, so it's indicated that you can't proceed until you add that one in there. Now I've left the VBAC screens out, but basically once you would hit the green add a VBAC client button, it'll take you through a series of questions building that VBAC record, and then it'll add it. Once you get to the last question, it'll say, okay, you've completed and added a VBAC into the table here. Um, for confidentiality's sake, there's obviously no names or anybody in there, but it just says VBAC client one, so you know if, if you have three or four of them to add, you just keep plugging them in there. Once you've satisfied the number that the validator is looking for, it'll let you press next to, to continue on with the report. And, and the final step then is just your attestation. All of, all of the forms, uh, paper forms, have an attestation at the bottom. Since they're doing this all online and all uh, continually, we're just going to have one attestation at the end where by your license number and your registration, we know their name. So in this example, I've just put in licensed midwife as the uh, individual's name. But the individual will check the box next to their name saying that they had uh, certified under penalty of perjury, that it's all true and correct. Up until this point, if they, you know, were filling out the report and they had to leave to go to an appointment or do something else, they'd come back in, the system would remember where they were at, the last record that they had entered, and let them continue off from where they were at. But once you check this box and you hit the submit, submit report button gets activated once you check that box, at that point, the record's locked. It's, it's submitted. Um, there is going to be a option that you can contact OSHPED to say, oh, I accidentally realized I forgot somebody. I found a file for it. If it's still within the reporting period where we're taking entries, OSHPED will be able to unlock that button. But we're really going to caution people, don't hit submit until you're 100% sure you've got all your records in. Um, once, they, once they have those records in there, then um, OSHPED is able to run some reports for us saying how many people have completed their reports, how many are left outstanding, so we can send some reminders, you know, please get your, your report data in. We've changed the support structure now so that our medical board help desk can also help out supporting licensees. We know that um, sometimes the OSHPED analyst just wasn't available, um, was away out sick for the day or whatnot. So we have the ability now to reset passwords and help licensees get into the system. Now, the medical board staff won't be able to see any of their data, anything from their report or anything like that. Just if they're having an account issue, can they get through? And so that offers kind of two options. So we're going to list ourselves, the Medical Board of California Help Desk, as the first option for technical support. Um, if they have actual reporting questions about the report, the, uh, Tanya will, will be the uh, individual that they're directed to. But, and then OSHPED is there for certain functions, like if they need a report unlocked or if they're having trouble getting to us, they can contact OSHPED. But the goal is um, we can help OSHPED um, with the burden of supporting this system now that we can have some access to a, an administrative portal as well. So um, I think it's, it's going to look much more modern. Uh, I hope it's much more user-friendly. Um, it's very intuitive, I think. Um, there's still the paper option if, you know, if people don't 
like filling it out online, but we, we're making it so um, they can go in there, have all of their documentation ready to go, and hopefully fill it out in one quick step. Um, one item that I don't have available today, unfortunately, is uh, our, our team is working on a kind of a quick fill-in form that will go into each patient file, and they can fill out the information and hopefully when it's time to report, and this will be for the 2019 year because obviously it wasn't ready for this calendar year, but they'll be able to fill out all the information on their patient forms and then at the end of the year when it comes time to report, they just grab all those patient forms, fill it all in. It should make it easier the next go around. So um, with that, if you have any questions or anything, I think. I have one about the, in regards to the two-factor authentication, if they leave because they have to go do something, how long is that? two-factor enabled? Like, do they have to do it every time they sign in? Or? Every time they sign in, okay. yes. And so it's valid for five minutes. If you get distracted, it's just as simple as going back to the login screen, entering your username and password again, you get a new code. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah. So this goes live, this next reporting system in March 30th of 2019. Yes, we, uh, our goal is to have it all in place by January 1st um, with uh, links and things going out to the licensees by the end of January, and yeah, it'll, oh. it should be rolling. So, that's great. Um, with any new launch, you always have you know some initial questions and stuff like that. So we, we think that's a, a good reason to have you know the NBC help desk involved too. We take calls all day from Breeze users and stuff, so this will just blend right into the uh, workload that we have. So, my question is about the VBAC reporting page. Um, and you had a list to list them all, and you put VBAC client number one. Are we supposed to put people's names in there, or? No, and in fact, it will never ask for anyone's name. Um, the idea was that that patient reporting form that I was mentioning that mm -hmm. won't be available, in, uh, it'll, it'll be available this year so they can start tracking for next <laughs> year's reporting. Um, but the idea is you'd fill out that patient form, then once you've entered it in the system, you write on, on your form, VBAC client one, so you just kind of know who you've put in and okay. who you haven't. So if you have four and you realize, oh, I made a data entry error on one of them, you, there was a little edit button there you could go back and edit. And so say you said, oh, this patient was VBAC client three, I'll go in there and edit their record, fix what I needed to fix, and then proceed on. But yeah, there's no uh, patient information stored. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any, are there any questions from the public? Rosanna Davis, um, licensed midwife and president of um, Calm. Thank you. The, this was great, very clear. Um, I'm sure it's a huge improvement. Um, I'm especially um, encouraged to see that there'll be a form to, uh, to put in each chart to help tally them. It might be helpful to also have a, a compilation page, but maybe that's already available somewhere if you're yeah. doing a paper form. Yeah, there will be kind of a, um, you know, like how you're preparing your taxes, you kind of have a form that tells you everything to get ready before you sit down and start doing this. So Perfect. we'll have something like that as well. There'll be a user guide again also to update the user guide that's out on our website. Okay. Um, um, one question. Um, how many midwife end users have been able to test it and try to break it? Uh, we haven't had any actual midwives try it out yet. Our team upstairs is, uh, you know, currently banging on it and uh, putting together the final pieces on it. Um, well, I'd like to recommend that you try to do that. So oh yeah, that, and and, yeah. and again, when we go live with anything, you know, the first sign of an issue too, we, the team ready to step in and uh, you know fix any problems that come up or anything like that, but. Oh, which brings to mind another question. Um, is there a hotline to communicate or email to submit um, questions or problems? Yes, and, and um, all that will be on the Contact Us page on the application itself, and it will list our help desk number and email address, and then as well as the OSHPED number uh, with clear definitions of what we can do for you, what OSHPED has to do for you that we can't do for you. And then probably also Tanya in case you have actual um, you know, non-technical questions. Uh, we'll be there to help for the technical stuff, and Tanya can help answer the business-related questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Am I hearing correctly that the um, contact us, how to contact people for problems, 
is only going to be on one page at the beginning of the whole thing? It'll be a link up at the top on any page. On any page. All these questions, I was zoomed in the actual question to show you. Um, the first registration screen, screens kind of showed the OSHPED header and things like that, and there was an actual little, uh, I can get back to it real quick. I was putting these, all these slides together, and I was like, oh, this is so many. So if you can see there, at the right where it says California Licensed Midwife Annual Report about the middle of the screen, and there's a home about, and then a contact us. So that contact us, all through the, all the questions, all through the thing, that contact us will be available. If you click that, it'll open up in your browser a new tab having all the contact information. So you stay where you're at in the report, but you'll... So uh, every page will have that access. A link to it, at least. A yeah. link. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, this looks really great. It looks like it's going to help a lot. That uh, the validate the built-in validation, I think, is really going to give us a lot better data. Thank you so much for your work. And and we are going to continue the relationship with Oshped, where they will host it with us. But if we get suggestions, it's again uh, something that we can maintain over time as well. Too. I, I don't expect any big form changes every year, but if we notice. Um, some informational text here and there. It makes it easier for people. We can keep adding that kind of stuff, too. So That's thank you great. for having me. Thank you so much. All right. So then I think we're going to have to jump down to agenda item number eight, overview of the enforcement process. Mrs. Kirschmeier. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here to present the enforcement process of the medical board. I'll be walking through these slides for you. I think you have them up there. So again, I'm Kimberly Kirkmeyer, Executive Director of the Medical Board, and I'll just start out right here. So obviously the mission of the Medical Board is to protect um, the California consumers, and we do that through our licensing and enforcement functions. And um, we're always trying to pay attention that we remain within that authority and we do that uh, really through objective enforcement on what we're talking about today of our Medical Practice Act or our Midwifery Practice Act for you all. Um, and then to, uh, we, we added this to our mission statement to promote access to quality medical care, but again, we only even do that through the licensing and regulatory functions of the board. So it has to fit within our authority and our jurisdiction. So I don't expect you to um, be able to see this slide, quite frankly, but I put it on all of my uh, presentations just so you know that this is actually a slide that is out on our website, and this is a really good snapshot of our enforcement process overview, and this is really helpful for individuals if they want to know how does the medical board process a complaint. It really goes from the beginning, getting a complaint, what I'll be going over today, all the way through the appeal process, but really is a, a snapshot of that enforcement process, and again, it is on our website. So how do we start our complaints? So all of the complaints that met the medical board received, we received them from different entities. And really, we consider anything that comes to the attention of the medical board, talking about any of our licensees, um, a complaint, and we will go through that process. So we get a lot of complaints from the public. Um, that could be you know, the patient's family, the patient themselves, um, individuals surrounding um, that entity, uh, that person could be sending in a complaint to us. We also get mandated reports. So these would be things such as um, the 805 peer review process reports. We could also get malpractice settlement reports. Those are mandated reports. Um, coroner's reports are also a mandated report we may get. Um, we can also get um, criminal charges because entities ha or uh, licensees have to report to the medical board if they have certain convictions. Um, all of those come into the medical board. We also have reports of death that have to happen under the business and professions code and then adverse event reporting um, is another mandated report that has to come to the medical board as well as the transfer forms for midwives also come to the medical board so we receive all of that information um, one thing else that we we also get
um, licensees. We get a lot of complaints from other licensees reporting either um, for this perspective, we may get a physician reporting a midwife, we get a mid midwife reporting a um, physician, we get physician to physician. And I always tell everybody it's always interesting how that has changed over time. It used to be our complaints that we got usually physician to physician was usually a licensee complaining about the advertising for the individual. And now I've really seen the change to where now individuals are really concerned about their profession and they've been more reporting, you know, individuals who may have a substance abuse problem or some mental impairment. So it has changed over the years as far as licensees reporting. Um, we also get them from other governmental agencies. So if that would be something like maybe the California Department of Public Health, if they go out and do an inspection, um, do a survey, they find that, that there's a licensee that has an issue they, in their opinion, and so they'll refer that to the medical board, Department of Healthcare Services as they're going through Medi-Cal, um, that they could report to the medical board as well if they think there's any negligence on the part of any t licensee of the board, they can send it to us. Um, we also have DEA reporting, um, more so obviously for the physician population, um, Medicare, just different governmental agencies that actually report to the board. And then the last group we get to is anonymous or miscellaneous complaints that can come in, and now especially with our online process, I think we see a lot more anonymous complaints because it's so easy just to go online and fill out the complaint. Um, so we do take complaints in any form or medium, though, so you can actually um, submit the complaint online through our portal there. You can do it in a paper format that we have online. You can fill that out and send that into the medical board, or we also do take in some situations um, complaints over the telephone, but we really ask everybody to provide those complaints in writing. It's just easier for us to take those complaints and know, have all of the information in case we forget to ask some bit of information. Um, and then the other thing that we, we always see, too, is that we can get complaints from the media. So if the media had an article and then they find out about something before we do, we use those as complaints as well. And then last but not least, we have been doing some proactive um, complaint processing, and those are more on, um, we've been asking for death certificates for overprescribing, actually, and any deaths that's related to um, opioid issues. And so those are more of a proactive, where we didn't wait for the complaint to come in. We found a, a, a means to get this information, and then we open up a complaint if we believe that there may, may be inappropriate prescribing, and we're also doing that on foster care prescribing as well. So those are more proactive. It's kind of a new world that we live in um, that we're looking into as well. So all of these complaints come into our complaint unit and they get opened into our database, um, the Breeze system on our enforcement side, and then we begin to triage, triage all of these allegations that come in from any complaint. Any complaint that comes into our office is looked at and evaluated. So there's nothing that we just get in immediately in the door and close it. Um, everything goes in through some type of a triage process. So obviously the first thing that we really are looking at is, is this complaint jurisdictional? Um, is it something that we actually have the authority over? Some things with licensees that we don't have the authority over is fee. They aren't happy with how much the, the midwife charged them, or maybe even professional conduct to some degree. Um, they didn't like the demeanor of the individual. They said made rude comments to them. Um, those kind of things, or hospital issues, they're not happy with the hospital. Um, those types of complaints are not within the jurisdiction of the medical board. So after we evaluate them, we'll close those complaints, but we do try to refer the individual complainant to the appropriate party so they can actually get their, um, their issues resolved through another means. We then look at to the next step, which is identifying whether that is a high priority or urgent complaint. And those types of complaints would be like sexual misconduct or licensee impairment, um, be it either substance abuse or mental um, or physical impairment. Um, those we look at, and if there's something that uh, comes in like that where we consider it an urgent complaint, it immediately goes out for investigation out to the district offices who do the investigations for the medical board. Then we also do some triage back looking at the licensee themselves. So is there any ongoing complaint against this individual that we currently are already looking into an ongoing investigation? Is there disciplinary action pending against this licensee? What's, what's the prior history for this individual? Um, have we closed other complaints um, on this same allegation? So we do that triage and then we get to the meat of working that complaint, identifying, okay, what's the next step? What do we need in order to process this complaint? 
So that's going to look like, do we need to get medical records? Um, do we need to get a licensee response? We need to write to the licensee and ask for a summary of the care and treatment. Um, and then we will send it, um, obviously, for that specialty review, which I'll be talking about in just a moment. So these are the types of complaints that we may receive. So we have a, a unit that deals with just conduct complaints, and that would be like maybe failure to provide medical records, failure to sign a death certificate, um, patient abandonment, fraud. Those are the types of complaints that we're looking at in the conduct world. Then we do have those urgent complaints that I actually already talked about, and I didn't talk about sexual misconduct, but that is another one that we received that is an urgent complaint that would go out for investigation. Um, unlicensed activity and 805 reports, those are both considered um, urgent complaints. Criminal conviction, it depends on the conviction that comes in. Um, if it is like a one-time DUI, that would not go immediately to our field because we have our own non-sworn investigators here in-house that would work those. So it depends on the type of conviction um, that we receive, but so that kind of defines where that case goes. Unlicensed activity, we obviously have to have enough information to be able to pursue it, um, and so that's sometimes a hard complaint to, to look into. And then last, the quality of care complaints, and we have a whole unit that deals with just quality of care, and that would be an, a licensee departing from the standard of care, and that would be that type of complaint that we receive. So from that next step, one thing that's important to know, and this is a lot of times uh, individuals all over the entire state don't understand this process for the medical board, but unlike maybe other states, in California, in order for us to be able to investigate a basically quality of care complaint, we have to have a release from the either the patient or from a patient's representative to be able to move forward to get those medical records. Um, if we can't get that release, we would have to have enough information to be able to subpoena those records. Um, so we can obviously submit a subpoena, but if we send out the notice to the consumer and they want to say that, no, I don't want my records released, then we would have to go through the court process to be able to enforce that subpoena, and that therefore would require us to have a good cause for getting that subpoena. The only thing outside of those two venues are actually being able to go through the criminal process and do a search warrant. So those would be for us, that would be more for um, potentially we're looking at um, over prescribing cases where there's actually, um, or sexual misconduct cases where there's actually a criminal aspect to it to where we could get a search warrant for those uh, licensees records. Um, and so some of the cases with the, uh, the midwifery community, some of those are actually hard for us to investigate because we may get a complaint from somebody that's not the patient and they want us to look into the care and treatment. We have to be able to get that patient's authorization. If we can't get that patient's authorization, we have to have enough information to get a subpoena. So sometimes with midwifery cases, they are difficult because sometimes the patients um, just will not sign off on those authorizations and those releases. So that's what we're looking at. And if we get multiple complaints, that might be grounds for a subpoena, but otherwise it's, it's difficult to prove that good cause. So then once we actually get that information, then we're going to actually contact the midwife and we're going to ask for um, the release of those records and then also a summary of the care and treatment that's been provided by that midwife. Once all of that information is received, and again, this is still we're just talking about in the world of our complaint unit here that's housed here at headquarters here. This is a first step. Then we gather all of that information. I'm really talking more about quality of care cases at this point. We would gather all of the information, the medical records, the patient's complaint, um, as well as the, any information that comes in from the midwife. And then we would package all that up and we would send that to a consultant. So we have a um, team of medical, I mean, of, of midwifery consultants that we would then send that complaint to. And their option at that point is either there's no departure from the standard of care or there is a departure and you believe it needs further investigation. So if they check the box for further investigation, then we're going to be sending that on to our district office, I'm not ours, it's under the Department of Consumer Affairs, but they do our investigation, so we would be referring that out. So after that consultant review, we kind of analyze everything that we have, even if it was a not a quality of care, we kind of look at the complaint and then we determine what is the outcome. So we would either close the complaint, so we can close that either no violation, so there was no violation on behalf of the licensee. We could close it insufficient evidence that we weren't able to substantiate that there was a, a violation that we could pursue disciplinary action on, so that would be closed insufficient evidence or we just couldn't gather enough e information. 
We can refer it for formal investigation like I've talked about, and I'll be going into more so on the, at the district office. Or we could also, also issue a citation and fine. So just recently, we did amend our midwifery regulations to allow us to issue citations and fine to midwives. So that would be another thing. And those would be for more technical minor violations, maybe failing to provide records, um, things like that, um, where we would issue that citation and fine. So the formal investigation process, it's really important to remember that this is an objective um, review. We're trying to prove or disprove the allegations that be have been provided to us by the complainant um, or by whatever means we received that complaint. So through the end of this year, so not very much longer, but through the end of this year and for the last uh, about 12 years, we've been working under what is called a vertical enforcement model. So every complaint that has to go for formal investigation gets investigated by a investigator with the Department of Consumer Affairs and their Health Quality Investigative Unit. That individual is actually a sworn peace officer. So it gets investigated with that individual joined with a deputy attorney general from the attorney general's office. So it's called vertical enforcement so they work it together they actually develop a plan they talk about that plan and then that deputy attorney general has to sign off on that plan to move that case forward so if it's a quality of care case, some of the things that then they're going to do at that point is they're going to, again, request records. And again, this may mean that they need additional records that weren't gathered in that upfront review. Um, and for especially for um, quality of care cases with midwifery, they may want to get the medical records from the, either the subject midwife or they could get prior or subsequent treating records um, for that individual if they had seen another um, uh, treater. They could get hospital records, let's say it was a transfer and they want to get the hospital records involved in that patient, and then any other relevant data such as fetal monitor strips, EKGs, MRIs, any other additional information. They're going to gather all of that information. Um, then the investigator conducts any interviews that are necessary. So they can interview the complainant, the client, they can interview um, patients' families, clients' families, and then any other witnesses. It might be other allied health care that were involved, nurses and, um, or patients or patients' caregivers. All of those individuals then get interviewed by these individuals. Um, and so you notice up until that time, there really aren't any interviews in our central complaint unit. This happens all outside once it gets to that district office. And then the other thing, we do have a district medical consultant. So this is actually a physician who works for the board or, or for the Department of Consumer Affairs now um, with those investigators over there. And they're really looking at more of the quality, the, the, not the quality, but identifying what questions we're going to ask the licensee when they come in. So because our investigators, while they have a lot of medical background, they don't have, a, you know, they're not a licensee. And so that individual brings in that world and asks, is able to to ask those questions. So then that is the next step is that gets submitted to that district medical consultant for that review and kind of setting up now we're going to get ready to actually then have interview the licensee. So the midwife is going to come in for an interview. Um, a lot of times that takes place with um, the licensee as well as their attorney. Um, and then in the interview as well, you'll have the investigator, usually the district medical consultant, as well as the deputy attorney general up through um, the end of this year. So all of them will then sit in on that interview. Then all of that information gets put together, kind of like it was up in the beginning in that upfront review. So all of the information, you're going to have the report of investigation, kind of where we are right now with this case. You're going to have all of the medical records. You're going to have everything that's been submitted by the midwife. All of that information now is going to go to that expert review. So again, we have midwives that are on our expert reviewer list. Um, that package will get all put together and sent to that expert for their review. Then that expert will come back and opine whether there's a departure and whether there's a violation of the law. They could say there's a simple departure or an extreme departure. And then from that, they're going to, I work with the, it'll be the investigator and really that deputy attorney general who's going to look at that case and identify now whether there's enough information for us to proceed for disciplinary action. And so that is really the next step on those quality of care cases. The investigation process is a little bit different for other types of complaints. Um, if it's a conviction, we're going to get the arrest records. We're going to get that conviction report from the court documents. 
Um, and we'll, again, even with those, we'll interview the midwife, the licensee will get interviewed. And it's important, too, in these types of cases for undercover operations. So um, for a lot of the complaints on the physician side, um, you'll have an easier time being able to do undercover operations because you, for the most part, don't need to have a pregnant woman right walking in. And so that's sometimes where these um, are a little bit different. So for unlicensed activity complaints, they're a little bit different for midwifery complaints, but they could do an undercover operation. And then in some cases, if we have um, received information where a licensee may have some type of um, impairment, we actually can compel them to a, an evaluation, and we do that in those outside of those cases as well. So then the outcome from that investigation. So if we determine that we cannot prove a violation by clear and convincing evidence to take disciplinary action, we will close that case. A lot of times they're closed just by no violation. We can't prove a violation. There was no violation that occurred. It can get closed. Again, even in this step, step, we could actually issue a citation and fine, again, for those minor violations. Or we will refer this. If we can prove by clear and convincing evidence that a violation occurred, we will submit that case to the Attorney General's Office for disciplinary action. Or if it was an unlicensed or even a midwife who's aiding and abetting um, another individual to practice midwifery without a license, those are items where we could refer it on for criminal action, and that's the step that we would take. We can also do both. So if we did have a licensee who was aiding and abetting unlicensed activity, we could refer it for disciplinary action for an accusation against that license, and we could also refer it for a probably a misdemeanor conviction um, through the criminal courts. So the first document that actually, so all of this process I've been talking through um, up to this point is all confidential. Um, this information doesn't get out there unless that we felt that there was a patient safety harm and we believed that this individual was a danger to the public, we could actually go through and ask for an interim suspension order. Um, so we'd have to go to the administrative law judge at the Office of Administrative Hearings and ask for that. But unless that happens, the first document that becomes public is when we actually file that document that's called an accusation. I don't like the word accusation, quite frankly. I a lot of people get think, oh, it's just an accusation at that point. You know, you're just it's the beginning step. But as you can see, we've gone through an entire investigation until we can um, um, file that accusation. So that is the first document, and that document will lay out each cause of action of what we believe that the licensee did wrong. So it'll have, you know, like gross negligence and competence, um, whatever type of violation it is, all of those will be listed in the causes of action. At that point, the licensee, so the midwife is going to have 15 days to file a notice of defense. So basically that's saying I don't agree with the charges, I want to contest those charges, and I'm going to be going through the process to contest those, which would ultimately could end up in a hearing on that accusation. If we don't get a notice of defense, I'm going to skip to number three first. If we don't get a notice of defense, and this is why it's really important for individuals to provide their um, address of record to the medical board, um, because there it could be that we file an accusation, they don't realize we filed an accusation, um, that notice of defense doesn't come in, that next step for us would be to file a default decision. And it's an automatic revocation of the license. And so that's the, the step. So a default decision could happen. It could also happen if they set up a hearing and the licensee does not appear for that hearing. That would result in a default decision in most um, cases. So that's a default decision. That's basically an uncontested accusation. And again, that's that automatic, not automatic revocation. It still has to go through a process, but it is a revocation. All default decisions result in a revocation. So the other types of decisions is stipulated settlement. So as soon as that accusation gets filed, what happens is the deputy attorney general will work with me as the individual that has the settlement authority here at the board, as well as working with the subject uh, midwife, as well as their attorney, and trying to come up with what is the best for consumer protection, what is the best disciplinary order that we can do while um, protecting the consumer. So does it need probation? Does it need just a public reprimand? Does it need a surrender of the license? So we will work, so the attorney, basically the two attorneys, or either the attorney, and if the um, the licensee doesn't have an attorney, we, we would be with that licensee. They'll work together on a stipulated settlement. 
And if we can come to an agreement as to what that settlement looks like, then that decision will be drafted and the licensee as well as the deputy attorney general will sign that decision and it will come to the board. So that will be the proposed stipulated decision. If no agreement can be reached, um, it will end up in an administrative hearing. So basically the deputy attorney general will be acting on behalf of the medical board to take action and then the licensee and their attorney will be presenting their case. So the case gets re presented before an administrative law judge at the Office of Administrative Hearings. And then that judge, based on all of the evidence that's presented, will provide a proposed decision at, to the board. So that's the second kind of administrative hearing will result in an, a proposed decision. So all of the decisions, with the exception of a surrender, um, if the licensee just says, I don't want to fight this process, I just want to surrender my license, or if it ends up in a default decision, I can actually sign off on those decisions. But all other decisions, be it a proposed decision from an administrative law judge or a stipulated decision where there is that agreement, all of those go to a panel of the medical board. So as you all know, we have um, 15, we don't have 15 seated, but we have um, potentially 15 members of the medical board. We have eight physician members and seven public members. Those are broken up into two panels by alphabet. Panel A has A to L, panel B has M to Z, and the licensee, the, it depends on the last name of the licensee, it'll go to either panel A or panel B. So those panels are then the ones who look at that decision and say, is this the best decision for public protection? Have, and we use um, disciplinary guidelines that we kind of look at to kind of drive some of our decisions. And then that's looked at. And then the, um, the board has the, that panel has the ability to either adopt the decision. So they can say, yes, we agree with this decision and it'll move forward. If it's a decision coming from a judge, they could non-adopt it. And then it will go through an oral argument process where they both come in and present in front of the board themselves or they could reject it if it's a stipulation and say basically I'm looking at this decision I don't agree with this decision and we want rather than four years probation we want to give five years probation um, they have that ability even with a, a decision that comes from a judge they could actually reduce this without going through that oral argument process they could say you know the judge gave this individual five years probation I think it should be four years and they could write that decision so they have the ability to decrease it without an oral argument hearing but if they want to increase it it does have to go through that process but all decisions outside of that surrender and default does have to go to the board. So obviously all licensees have an appeal process. They do have their, do, uh, their, um, their uh, rights to appeal it. If it's a default decision, they could actually request for that to be vacated and it has a very narrow window of 10 days is all from the date that that um, document actually goes out revoking the license that they come back and say, hey, I, I actually wanna fight that. I didn't get the accusation and they can do that. If it's a uh, board order from a administrative law judge's decision, then they can actually uh, petition to the board themselves for reconsideration. Maybe they don't like the, the outcome of that decision and they can petition for that. And then obviously um, they can uh, take that all the way up through superior court. They can actually skip the board for that petition for reconsideration and go straight to the superior court and file a writ of mandate. And if they don't like that outcome, they can go to the court of appeals and fight it all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, I, on our physician side, I can tell you we have had cases that have ended up in the Supreme Court. I don't think I've seen any um, midwifery case end up that far. These are the disciplinary outcomes that could happen from those cases. Um, it can be as for as, as egregious as a revocation or a surrender of the person's license um, to a public reprimand, which is in, there's no really terms and conditions as far as monitoring that gets hap, um, opposed, uh, presented to that licensee. It's basically just the public reprimand and they may have to take some educational courses. And then in between, you can have probation. And again, not only are we trying to protect the public, but the law also, at least for the physician side, and we kind of use it also for our licensee uh, base no matter what, and so to pertain to midwifery, we're 
we're also trying to rehabilitate the licensee. And so that's why we put individuals on probation and try to give them courses that will actually educate them. So you could have educational programs. We can actually also do prohibited practices. You can't do um, these types of procedures. Um, for physicians, we would imp impose prescribing pr uh, restrictions and definitely, uh, usually in most cases that are quality of care, some type of a monitor, practice monitor for that individual. <coughs> Excuse me. So once that action becomes final, it's actually posted on the board's website. It's on the um, profile of the licensee. And so it's, it's basically under our public documents as well as that uh, profile for the midwife. It's also reported to the National Practitioner Data Bank. And then lastly, it's also put in our newsletter. So all of that information is out there. And with that, I would open it up for questions. Quite extensive. <laughs> questions from the members? Thank you, Kim. With all the years that I've been coming to the medical board meetings and on the council and all of it, I didn't know half of this. Great. So I, this is really valuable. Um, I do have a couple of- Not great of that you didn't know, Karen, but great that we could. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, I notice on here it says the vertical enforcement process is changing effective January 1st. What kind of changes are there going to be? It is. So it's going to remove the deputy attorney general be working with the investigator. And it'll go back to prior to 2006 when this went, where it would be investigated and then it would be transmitted to the attorney general's office. Remember at the point I said the outcomes refer to disciplinary action? That would be when the deputy attorney general gets involved in the case. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, I have heard uh, some rumor, I suppose it is, that when those who are accused, those who are up for disciplinary action come before uh, the board, the panels, the, the in investigators, that it's better for them not to have an attorney, that it's looked at as in some ways a proof of guilt that you have an attorney with you. And I'm wondering what your take is on that. So I can't say whether you should or should not have an attorney. That is completely up to the licensee themselves. Of course. Um, I can tell you for, I don't have a number, I'm pulling this completely off the top of my head, but I would say on the physician side, you're looking at probably 90 to 95% of the licensees who will have an attorney with them. And that's even from the point um, of that initial letter they get from the medical board. Mm -hmm. Just in the response, a lot of them will get an attorney. So I, d I don't think that when they're looking at it, they shouldn't be looking at it whether you walk in with an attorney or don't walk in with an attorney. Again, that is an objective review both on our side and CCU as well as out there, and it shouldn't make any difference in the outcome of that case. Okay. Yeah. I think that's it for the moment. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, this was very informative. Um, I have several questions. Let's see if I can pull them out here. So going back to the beginning of the process, are midwives informed if there's a complaint made only if, or only if it goes forward? So it depends on the complaint. So if it's something where we need to contact the midwife to get the medical records, or I'm trying to think of another complaint that would come in on a, on a midwife. Let's say that they said they were, I guess they could have an advertising complaint that came in and they weren't following something with the advertising. If we needed to reach out to them, then they would know at that point because we're reaching out to them and we say we received a complaint. But if we got a complaint that said the midwife was rude to me, we're going to close that, and the midwife would never know that they got that complaint. Okay. Um, at what points during this whole process might um, a, a case or licensee be um, reviewed by a doctor? 
So the the upfront review is going to go to a med a midwifery and that central complaint unit. It'll go to a midwifery expert. That individual will review it. If it goes out for investigation, that district medical consultant that I talked about, that individual is a physician, and so they're looking at it um, at that point. So that would be a physician review. Um, they don't have that final say in most cases. Um, but if it goes for an expert review, we'll have a midwifery um, expert review it. But at that point, if the deputy attorney general believes that a physician would also be helpful, then they may have a physician review that case as well. So it could happen at that point. So the deputy attorney can request it be reviewed. It can be by requested a or during the investigation if they believe we're working with the district medical consultant needs another expert review that could happen as well. Okay. And are those is that how it unfolds or that's per the guidelines? That's how it would unfold. And depending on, it, let me give you an example on the physician side. Let's say we had a physician who were looking at a pain management doctor, but he was doing pain management, but he was actually an internal medicine doctor. We may have both an internal medicine doctor review it as well as a pain management physician review it. So if they need additional expert review, they'll, they'll request that for them to prove the case or disprove it. Okay. And then um, opinions are written by doctors, midwives, both, it depends? Both. Who, so anytime we send it for a consultant review, that, write, that opinion has to come back in writing. Okay. And? Of course, it's confidential unless it goes to hearing or at point of um, filing an accusation to come out at discovery. Um, do you have a range of... Um, financial costs of complaints and investigations? I don't. I, I can tell you for the, the only thing I have is for a case that goes through to hearing. Um, we believe it's about thirty about $30,000 more than if it was a complaint that just went through the settlement process. Now, I, I only know that because we just worked on that for another, another item, but I couldn't tell you how much a, co a case costs from start to finish. And then is there, uh, thank you, is there any data um, on comparing the types of complaints, investigations, and decisions between midwives and physicians? No. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, very separate. And volume, just volume itself, Roseanne, I had to tell you, I mean, we have about probably 500, well, about 450 disciplinary cases with doctors and with uh, midwifery. I, don't, I think in this last year, I'm not even sure we had one even. It's quite low. It's very low, yeah. Um, and then does a probation officer have midwifery training? No, they, they our, our probation monitor, so you're talking probation once a person monitor, gets on put yeah. on probation, no, they don't even have medical training. They are a, an individual who's a, a civil servant um, okay. of the state. And th they're really, what they're monitoring is their compliance with the condition. Okay. Now, a practice monitor, if we were to have a practice monitor for a midwi mid <coughs> midwife, then that individual, you'd want that person to be a midwife that's providing that practice monitor. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Maddie Shermack. I'm a licensed midwife. Um, I'm wondering... How does the medical board receive feedback on this process? In what regard? If you were a licensee that had it, something, yeah, you I can mean, always Yeah, I mean, if I were like, I don't like that, uh -huh. I don't like how you did that, how, like, you what is the process for that? You can send a letter to that? the medical board. Okay. And we'll um, look into it. And especially if it's regarding, like, an investigator or, you know, the way we were treated by an analyst or anybody, yeah, we'd want to hear that feedback. Cool. Um, I'm also wondering how frequently you get complaints from payers, like insurance companies. Is that a thing here? I'm trying to think. I, you know, I'm not sure that we've even received it. We would get potentially fraudulent for a complaint for yeah. fraud. That would be the only one. I'd have to look at our annual report to see how many fraud, but it's not a high, high volume. Okay. Yeah. And for, for midwives... I'm not sure that I've ever even seen They just seen complain a to us directly, I think. <laughs> Is that what they do? Um, yeah. <laughs> and I'm also wondering so, like, um, it sounded like operating undercover was not a common thing 
and someone would already need to be under investigation to be having that experience with someone undercover? Is that a thing? Or do medical so board people just go undercover? To they can go undercover. Sneak around. Let me give you an example for our overprescribing cases right now that we have. We will actually have individuals go undercover and go into a physician's office and um, go through the process of, of being seen by that physician to see what their prescribing practices are. Can you give an example of what that's like if someone is undercover interacting with a midwife? It, it would probably be the same if we, ha and I would think for a uh, midwife, it would probably be more of an unlicensed midwife where okay. we would go in and try to see, are you practicing midwifery without a license? Okay, I'm gonna cool. walk in and see if you'll treat me. Great. Or call you, I guess, in that regard. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm also wondering, I'm sorry, thank, thank you for your time. Um, going off of what Rosanna was asking about, like at what, at what process in the, investigation process, the licensee would first be interacting with a licensed midwife who is um, helping investigate? Like when, when so does it get to that point? The midwife would never be working with that consultant. So that consultant is a, a medical board um, uh, contracted individual. Okay. So they would never go to the subject midwife. The, the subject midwife really, the only time they're going to interact with the board is when they come in for an interview and when they go to hearing. Okay. Thank you. Other than responding to letters. Cool. Thank you. Can we make a, a pitch that if you're interested in yes. being a medical cons a midwifery consultant or a midwifery expert, you can go onto our website or talk with staff and apply? Actually, that, that can't be um, understated because we do desperately need midwifery experts. And it's all on our website, and it's an easy process to apply. So as much as, like, Rosanna, if you can get that out to the community and the association. Who have applied and no one's followed up with them. Okay, so if you can let, if, tell them to contact me because we, I, had a, I was at a physician group, and I had the same thing where an individual came up. So... As much as possible, let me know, and we will follow up those individuals. They do have to sign a contract with the board, um, but it's not a, an intensive process whatsoever. So please, please have them follow up. Thank you, Mrs. Kirschmer. So moving on to agenda number nine, Ms. Murray. Hello. Before I get started on the statistics, I wanted to make mention of the MAC vacancies that are coming up. In July 19, I'm sorry, in July 2019, MAC will have three vacancies. One licensed midwife, currently held by Diane Holzer. One licensed physician and surgeon, currently held by Dr. Anne-Marie Adams and one public member position currently held by Jocelyn Dugan. All of the vacancies are for a three-year term set to expire in June 2022. The announcement for the recruitment for the MAC vacancies will be posted on the board's website at the end of December. Board staff, uh, board staff will send notices to all licensed midwives and subscribers on the board's sub subscriber list. Applications for these positions will be discussed at the March meeting and the MAC vote and the MAC will vote to make recommendations for appointments to the board at that same meeting. Applicants who have applicants will have the opportunity to come before the MAC and provide a statement in support of their application, but it is not required. We'll move on to the licensing. Can I have a, ask a question about that? Given that we haven't approved the administrative policy and we can't do that at this meeting that means that we don't really have term limits right so there wouldn't be vacancies if the if the manual isn't approved which is not going to be at this meeting so there won't be vacancies in December is that correct We will still have the vacancies come June of 2019, so we will still have to go through this recruitment. Yeah. If at the next meeting there is a decision on term limits, then 
those that are fill those vacancies will just fall into those. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sorry, I just got confused there. Oh, no, that's okay. Karen Ehrlich, licensed midwife. I'm not sure it's clear. The vacancies exist and have to be filled. The incumbents can reapply and could be voted in or could be voted out. Yeah, I was just confused. That, that is true. We're just announcing right. that this is coming. It will be posted on our website. We will be notifying all licensees of these vacancies. And then at the next meeting, these applications will be reviewed and voted on by the MAC members. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to statistics. We'll be, just, uh, be providing the licensing statistics. If you do not have a packet, they are available on the back table. If you'll turn to tab nine, um, 981 of the packet, Licensing to statistics for licensed midwives in the first quarter of the fiscal year 2018-2019, the board received six new applications, issued five licenses, and had 406 renewed and current midwife licenses, licenses slightly up from last year where we had 395. If you'll turn to 9B, and I'm getting these numbers from the bottom, pa the bottom numbers on the page. If you'll turn to 9B1, this shows the transfer of plant out of hospital delivery forms. The board received 40 hospital reporting forms, all of which were licensed midwives. On page 9C1, are the enforcement statistics for licensed midwives. Five complaints were received in the first quarter none were referred to criminal action, and no complaints were referred to investigation or to the Attorney General's office. On page 9C2, are the enforcement statistics for unlicensed midwives, and as you can see, there were three complaints received in the first quarter, and one was referred to investigation. On page 9C3 are the enforcement statistics for transfer of out, I'm sorry, for transfer of plant out of hospital delivery to hospital reporting forms. And as you can see, none were referred to investigation. And finally, moving on to 9C4, the enforcement statistics for transfer out of planned, sorry, I always mess this up, the statistics for, Enforcement statistics for transfer of out of plant. Oh Lord, Tra <laughs> sorry. The enforcement statistics for for transfer of plant out of hospital delivery to hospital reporting forms for unlicensed midwives. There were no forms received. Any questions? Questions from members? No? From the public? Rosanna? Uh, Rosanna Davis, just a clarifying question. What is the, the period of time for the quarters? So quarter one is? July. July through September. September. Hey, thank you very much. So that would be the end of the agenda. I'm not sure what, if we can set an agenda for the next meeting. So uh, here's what we can do is we can discuss the administrative manual just to get the discussion going. Uh, you can't take a vote on changing it, but we can at least start looking at it. 
Um, also, we do need to set a tentative date for the next meeting. Um, so it'll be, you know, tentative by agreement and, um, you know, not an official vote of the MAC. Um, and people can still suggest future agenda items. So. Okay. And then how do they get firm, like, then we just email the other members and get their agreement on it, and that sets it? Or? There, there's no vote on future agenda items, okay. so it's just what people would like to see at a future meeting, okay. and then um, you know it goes before the board for approval, and then uh, you, in conjunction with uh, chief of licensing and executive director, set what the actual agenda will be for the upcoming meeting. Then do we want to move to the agenda item for, of the administrative manual? That's we what should I do that? would okay. suggest. Okay. Okay, so at the last uh, meeting in August uh, during the discussion of term limits, there was uh, a lot of discussion uh, related to vacancies, term limits, what happens if we don't get you know, recruitment, eligibility. There was also additional discussion related to educating MAC members when they're new, how important that is. Um, as a result of that discussion, board staff um, suggested bringing back a administrative manual that the MAC could use, similar to what our board members uh, use and have adopted. So board staff has put together um, a draft for the MAC to review. Um, I thought we could just go through section by section um, I'll give you a little overview of just what it is. And then you can just talk about it and then at the next meeting we'll have further discussion and, and, and a vote. So if you turn to agenda item six in your packet, um, under tab one, this would be just the overview of this administrative manual. It just provides background, the law that established the MAC and the uh, how many MAC members are are on the um, the the council. In tab two, it provides general rules of conduct uh, for a member, providing just uh, your overall you know role and responsibilities as a member on the on the MAC. And if there's anything that you want me to specifically go over, you know, that's fine. Just let me know since this is just discussion at this point. Um, under the next tab is meeting protocols. This outlines for a MAC member all of the things that they need to be aware of as taking on the responsibility of being a member. It goes into the frequency of the meetings, um, attendance, what a quorum is, um, how we notice meetings, agendas, um, minutes, um, indicating that these are and can be uh, recorded and webcasted. Um, this administrative manual essentially, for somebody new to the council provides a very good explanation of kind of how this looks and is a reference guide that can be used and it also established consistency. Uh, the next uh, tab is recruitment of a MAC. It uh, talks about just a summary of how we recruit and there's attached the application for anyone interested in being on uh, the MAC. This is the application that is utilized right now. The next section is term limits and selection of officers. Um, there is a recommendation in here. Um, Carrie, you might want to talk about a little. She's, she's found some additional information that um, kind of changes things uh, a little bit, so I'm gonna turn this over to yeah, Carrie. Uh, I did find a, a general code section under business and professions code, it's section 131, and it provides that for any uh, committee that would apply to a council, 
uh, member of a board under the Department of Consumer Affairs, it, the, it shall serve um, no more than two consecutive full terms. So I know that we were trying to provide kind of a safety that if there, someone wasn't interested, there wasn't someone qualified, that there could be an extension. Um, but, but this section does not provide for that. And so um, it, it is conceivable that someone could come in to replace someone who hadn't completed their term yet. They could complete that term and then serve an additional two full terms after that. Um, but after they have served two consecutive full terms, they have to step off and someone else gets the opportunity to serve. So that makes recruitment all the more important, educating uh, potential members all the more important uh, because we will have to have some movement in membership. Thank so you. this will be adjusted for the next <laughs> meeting <laughs> yes. so that it can be voted upon and meet that statute. So we do have to establish term limits. Yes. Um, the next uh, section is just the mandatory training and our policies, and this is when someone new comes on to the council. Uh, there is mandatory training and policies and procedures that have been established by the department that are mandatory to review and sign, which all of you are already familiar with, with that. And if at any time anything needs to be updated, board staff will notify you and, and make sure that we have that. Um, the next uh, section um, provides you all of the travel guidelines, um, gives direction on how you go about you know, contacting staff, what we will do, how we will schedule things, and what is reimbursable to you. Um, and then the next three tabs are just you know, the laws, regulations, and the, what was that last one? the practice guideline for the California licensed midwives. So I know we'll have to bring this back uh, to the next meeting to be uh, again discussed, reviewed, and then adopted. But is there anything specific that you'd like to discuss now in any of these sections? I just want to clarify term limits are a requirement and not something we can vote on and decide against. Yes, per the, the Business and Professions Code, Section 131, it, it would apply to the MAC. Okay, okay. thank you. Karen Ehrlich, licensed midwife, who served as vice chair for a while. I don't know why that position went away, because ever since the uh, council, it didn't, go away. it didn't go away. Who is the vice chair? Well, I keep trying to to nominate Barbara, and she keeps not being here. So I didn't hear. It, we've, I've been trying to nominate Barbara, and she hasn't been here. So we've been deferring it until she's here. It, I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think this manual will help people get on board much quicker. So appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah, there was nothing I saw that. Wasn't clear. It was all very clear. And All right then, so I guess our next business is to tentatively set our next meeting. And so do we wanna look at the dates that have been so suggested in the packet? Which were, were they? <coughs> the March dates? March 7th or March 4th, 14th, sorry.
I guess, uh, how about, I would like to propose March 7th. That's fine with me. Okay. Yeah, I can see. All right. March 7th. And how about the agenda items for the next meeting? Claudia, you said that you wanted something. Yes, I've been hearing from a lot of midwives and have also experienced myself incidences where um, physicians are refusing to provide care for patients, for their patients who are choosing an out-of-hospital birth. This is especially problematic in the case of HMOs where it leaves us without recourse to necessary medical procedures that may not be affordable, such as ultrasounds and biophysical profiles and um, lab testing. And it then becomes the responsibility of our client to pay that out of pocket when they are already paying for insurance, often that includes maternity coverage. Um, and then they, but they have no recourse to a physician because the physician that's been assigned to them refuses to see them. And um, I would like to discuss possible ways that we can deal with that, possible remedies. Rem so remedies for um, physician refusal to see midwifery clients? Yeah, or actions. Or we need to be able to refer our clients and have their insurance pay for the care they need. It's a safety issue. And then obviously we need the program updates and the, the normal things. But we probably won't have gotten into the LMAR reporting cycle as deep. I, I'm no, not sure if we need that the next meeting. We, we certainly will the meeting after, but yeah, but not in this one. Okay. Um, and the man, the administrative manual. Right, and the rest of the dates, and I guess at that point we'll have to also approve two sets of meeting minutes. Yeah. Um, and the vice chair. We'll vote on that. Um, program updates, what else? Oh, we, we did, I forgot to tell people if you'd noticed the um, agenda, we deferred the, the presentation by uh, Rosanna Davis on the protected peer review. We, do, we decided to defer that to the next meeting as well, so we should put that on the agenda. It was going to be today, but we deferred it till next meeting. And what else? Um, oh, the um, discussion of where we'd like to see the MAC to go in the coming year. thing. Um, when we were talking about the open positions and um, that th that people will have the opportunity but are not required to come to the meeting, last March we discussed that um, there's never been anyone appointed who had not been at the meeting and um, that that should be somehow um, communicated to applicants. So what I recall that the MAC had asked for is that when we go through this recruitment process that we put in our notice that they have the option to come before the MAC and present, you know, that their, their application and anything that they wanted to say. So are we still good with that? Because that's what we had planned on doing. That's always been there. Um, 
it wasn't in the, it's not in the letter that we submit. So we do a cover letter mm -hmm. and a notice that we're recruiting for three positions. It was asked of the MAC that we include in the information that we're sending out the opportunity that they want to come before the MAC. Okay. And, but it is optional. They don't have to come. Unless there's something else that you're, you're, you're considering or you'd like for us to do. I was under the impression that um, that MAC had, dis had discussed um, or public comment or something had talked about um, that it's an option and people know it's an option, but what people don't know and need to be um, told is that the MAC has never approved an applicant who wasn't at the meeting. Does anybody else remember that? Well, you discussed it, yeah, because it seemed like that <coughs> showed a, an the, applicant's desire to actually kind of show up and do the work. So I, just so I'm clear, you're saying that you want clarification that the MAC has never denied someone that has not become? I'm sorry. The MAC has never... Um, Pick. Chosen, chosen someone? Mm -hmm. someone who wasn't here. Because it is optional. Um, I would not put that in a letter from the medical board, from the um, program. But by all means, I would recommend that you, as midwives, um, put that word out there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And, and frankly, it could be that someone is sick who's eminently qualified and just, you know, their plane couldn't make it or they couldn't make it. But... Um, you know, I mean, for, you may decide to do it, and otherwise you shouldn't have it optional. Yeah. I mean, right. you know, exactly. I've been in places where they've required you have to attend the meeting and where the, where you're running. So, um, if you're going to make it optional, we need to have it optional and be an issue, or don't make it optional. Yeah, that goes on the agenda too. The <laughs> the vacancies. <laughs> So I guess if there's nothing else, then um, we will adjourn the meeting. Okay. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>